Today there's a word in the house. Is anybody ready for the word this morning? Now, almost five months ago, this is crazy. I knew I was going to be giving out so much at conference that I wouldn't have time to prepare for my message on Sunday. Because y'all know how, like, I, hey, listen, I'm trying to give you filet mignon. Every time you come up in here, if you eat McNuggets in the word during the week, I'm trying to give you a steak. And so I got to prepare a whole bunch to do that. And so I called one of my good friends out of Houston. Um, who, his name is Jeremy Foster, Pastor Jeremy Foster. And uh, now the thing you need to know is there's only probably been four guest speakers that have ever spoken on Transformation Church's stage outside of our home team. Like, how many enjoyed Pastor Bree's message last week? <laughs> Daily faith. Y'all know I just went ahead and called her Pastor Bree because she brought that work. Y'all, can we thank God for the gifts we have in our own house? Bree, we love you. She checked all of us last week. It's like, oh, I'm the pastor. Uh-oh. Need to read my Bible again. But today, um, the man of God who is going to speak has helped me more to do what God's called me to do than almost everybody in the world. There's only a few people that have helped me look me in my eyes and said, hey, don't shrink back. Like what God's doing in your life, he would see me walk in the rooms with people that I've admired for years and like kind of be like, no, like this, that. And he'd pull me into the corner and he'd say, listen to me, you're here on purpose. And he said, don't you dare turn your light down because you're in here, shine. Make them go back and ask God, what do I need to do? I mean, and I'm, I'm sitting here like, and the thing you're going to love about, I call him Uncle Jeremy, so he's Uncle Jeremy to you too. He crazy. You know, I like crazy people. Because the first time I met him, he's like white and wears cowboy boots, but it's like hood and knows how to sing R&B. Like, some of y'all are like, how? I know, how? But he leads one of the fastest growing churches in Houston in four years. The reason I really do believe that he's speaking into this, because we've been going about the same time, and in four years, they have seen their church go from a small group of people to over 10,000 people every weekend. And they just celebrated 34,000 salvations. And oh, y'all y'all know that's why, that, y'all know that's why we exist. So we're celebrating 34,000 salvations with Hope City. We all stand all over the place. And can we give for the first time at Transformation Church, my friend, a mentor of mine, to speak the word. And y'all better talk back to him today. Coming to the stage is Pastor Jeremy Foster. Come on, let's give Jesus an ovation of worship that only a king is worthy of. Come on, somebody, lift your voice in this house. Man, it feels good in the room. Turn to your neighbor and say, you look good. Turn to your second choice and tell them, you look good too. <laughs> you can be seated. Thank you, Pastor Mike. Let me first call out the obvious. To all of those of you sitting here and in additional seating and watching online, I can feel your collective disappointment. I can feel it. You're like, ah, 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 this is not Pastor Mike. I don't know how you knew, but. <laughs> I love Pastor Mike and Natalie. Give it up for them, man. What amazing people of God. Listen, not only. Is he one of the greatest preachers of our time, one of the greatest communicators? Both of them are some of the greatest leaders of our time. They also have the coolest style in the world. No, for real. Pastor Mike, the, I don't know anybody that can wear, like, awesome sneakers, a pair of camouflage pants, an orange shirt, a multicolored jacket, and everybody's like, man, I wish I had that outfit. And he's like, you can for $399. I'm playing. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Guys, come on. I've got no style, literally. My wife bought this shirt. I did not buy these jeans with a hole in them. I wore that hole into the jeans. I got, I got my boots on. Somebody, thank you. There's one cowboy in the room. 
Somebody told me not long ago, they were like, bruh, pastor, bruh, bruh, you need to get some off-whites. So I told my wife, I was like, somebody said I need to get some off-whites. What's that? So she pulled up a picture with some black tennis shoes. I was like, I'm a little colorblind, but that ain't off-white. That's way off-white. That's black. <laughs> I didn't even know what it was. But I'm honored to be here. One more time, give your pastor a great big hand and his family. I love you, man. I love you. Rocking that pink jacket. I love you, man. What a church. What an amazing place. And I have a family. I love my wife and my kids. I have five kids. I think I have a picture of my, my family, uh, my wife and my kids. Can you give them a great big hand? My daughter, Jessie, is here with me. And that's, that's my little fam right there. I got five kids, not because I like kids, because I like my wife. Come on, somebody. Hey, hey, hey. We've been married. <laughs> the real preacher will be back next week, guys. Come on, let's, let's make it last. We've been, married, we've been married 19 years, and when I, when I first, thank you, when I first, when I first met her, she had just given her life to Christ, so she was a church girl. And back in the day, you had to have game. Y'all don't have to have game no more. Where's the single people at? Raise your hand, you're single. Uh, no, just hold them up, hold them up, hold them up, hold them up, look around, this is what you're looking, this is what you're looking at right here, this is what you're working with. Some of y'all be like, I'm going to switch sections, I'm going over there. Hey, girl, hey. Back in the day, <laughs> back in the day we, did, we didn't have Facebook. We didn't have Instagram. We didn't have Snapchat. We had to really chat. You had to be able to walk up and say, hey, how you doing? My name is, I'm like, it's a real conversation. You could just text somebody. By the way, you shouldn't still just text somebody. You, sh you should walk up and have a conversation. I'm preaching. Y'all don't even know I'm preaching. <laughs> Relationship goals. But I had, I had to have game. Like a church girl game is different. You got to have church girl game. You can't just be like, hey, girl. Be like, hey. Your name must be Faith. Because you're the substance of things I've been hoping for. Ah, y'all ain't ready for your boy. Hey, girl, I've been studying the book of Numbers. I noticed yours wasn't in here. Can you write it right there in my Your boy put the stud in Bible study. Let's go. All right, guys, come on. Let's, come on, sit down. This, it's offensive. Let's. to somebody next to you and say, we're going to have fun. But I came with the word and I got it on Thursday while I was sitting here in this unbelievable conference. The Lord spoke to me sitting right over there and I wept for about an hour and 15 minutes. And I love to watch what God is doing in this church and what God is doing in this church and the online community. Those of you watching around the world, this is very unique. God's doing something here and I want to deliver what God gave me for this weekend. He literally spoke it to me Thursday I perfected it on the plane yesterday, and I bring it to you today. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12 says, In the same way, <laughs> we can see and understand only a little about God now, as if we're peering at his reflection in a poor mirror. But someday, we're going to see him in his completeness face to face. Now, all that I know it's hazy. Turn to somebody next to you and say, it's hazy. And it's blurred. But then I will see everything clearly, just as clearly as God sees into my heart right now. And this weekend, I'm going to preach to you on this subject. Hazy faith. Hazy faith. Some, sometimes I can't see exactly what he's doing, but I'm still going to follow the cloud. I'm not going to stay where he was. I'm going to stay where he's going. It's a little bit hazy, but I'm going to follow the hazy faith. When I, have, when I have hazy faith, that means I'm going to trust him when I can't track him. That means I can't doubt him because I know too much about him. God does some of his best work in the dark. The Bible says Moses approached the thick, black darkness where God was. Can I tell you this, Pastor Mike? He invited everybody to come into the thick, black darkness. He said, all of y'all come up to the mountain. And they said, no, we're afraid. Let Moses go. And only one man had hazy faith. Aren't you grateful for a pastor with some hazy faith? 
He said, I don't know how we're going to do it. It's going to cost, it's going to cost us God knows what to keep all of this for the weekend. By the way, we're going to pay for all of this for the weekend, your whole rental. We're going to pay for your whole rental. Because it's not about one church. It's about the kingdom, baby. Let's watch God do something we've never seen God do before. It's going to take every one of us pushing and saying, I don't know what to do, but I'm going to follow you. I ain't got no backup in me. That's why I love your pastor. There ain't an ounce of quit in him. There ain't no backup. Hazy faith. Turn to your neighbor and say, follow the cloud. <laughs> this place to preach. Turn to somebody next to you and say, neighbor, don't memorize me. Because you won't recognize me when this is over. I'm going to walk out of here in a new way. I'm going to walk out of here in some new shoes. I'm going to walk out of here with some hazy faith. All right, sit down. If you're going to have hazy faith and you can't see it all, listen, if you've got to see everything in order to walk, that ain't faith. The opposite of fear is faith. No, no, no. The opposite of faith is certainty. Or when I'm certain, I don't even have to pray about it because I know. But when I'm walking in faith on a Thursday or a Wednesday, God can say, this is your new home. And I'll get up and say, don't know how it's going to happen, but this is our new home. And everybody goes, ah! But they're not going to be the ones in the back room trying to figure it out. But when you have hazy faith, everybody can come together and say, all right, let's boldly go where God has called us to go. Hazy faith. Hazy faith takes three things. It costs three things. Turn to somebody and say crazy prayers. You gotta learn how to you gotta learn how to pray crazy prayers. I was raised in a praying family. And here's what I know: this church is not just a crowd of people. You're here because a small group of people, somewhere that you may have never even heard about, that you may have never met. I met a lady backstage that's been at this church for 16 years. I was like, all right, veteran. This is happening. Because a small group of people somewhere before you got here got on their knees, pounded the ground, some crazy prayers, and said, God, whatever you want to do, we don't have to get credit as long as you get the glory. And that's what it's going to keep taking for you, for our online community, for everybody around the world. Let's keep praying crazy. I was raised by a crazy mama. My mother's a church mother. You, you know what I'm talking about. The, the crazy people just pray over anything. If you see... <laughs> If you see my mom in Walmart and you're like, hey, can you pray for me? She'll be like, right now in the name. I'm like, hey, you ain't got to pray for him right now. <laughs> my mother prays over parking places. Oh, there's some church mothers in here. Literally, I, I was with my mother last Christmas. We went to Kroger's. And we pulled in, and Mama said, right now in the name of Jesus, God, give us a good parking place. Six people pulled out. Like there were people, they weren't even ready to leave. They're like, why are we leave? We shoplifting. We ain't even paid. I don't know. We got to go. <laughs> Crazy prayers. I'll pray over anything. I'll pray for anything. Crazy prayers. It's saying yes. Now what's the question? Yes, Lord. Some of y'all need to wake up with a yes. Yes, Lord. What's the question? Remember that old song we used to sing it? I'll say yes, Lord, yeah. To your will and to your way, I say yes, Lord, yeah. I'll trust you and obey. Sing it with me. When your spirit speaks to me, with my whole heart I'll agree, and my answer will be. Remember that? Lord, yeah. And that's good. But I think some of us sing it that way, but we mean it like this. I'll say maybe, Lord, maybe. If what you're asking is not too hard, I'll say, I'll think about it, I'll think about it, I'll think about it. If you bless me with a brand new car, when your spirit speaks to me, we'll just have to wait and see. And my answer will be, Lord, what's in it for me? 
And at some point, it's got to stop being about you. And it's got to start being about Jesus. And it's got to start being about, Lord, whatever you say, I'm in. I'll do it. I'll go. I'm ready. Here's what I know about your pastor and about your team. It's all glory to God. It's all glory to God. I was raised in a praying family of church planters. We went to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, whenever I was about five years old. Come on, North Carolina. And we launched a church in Winston-Salem. We had 13 people on our team, and six of them were kids. It was a bad team. We learned how to pray. And I remember we had a little building. They were coming to repossess our church pews. We couldn't pay for it. We didn't know what we were doing. My dad was in there just praying, just crazy prayers, just praying crazy. When you pray crazy prayers, God will show up. He likes that kind of stuff. It's a little weird, but he likes that kind of stuff. My dad is praying crazy prayers. My mom's praying crazy prayers. And one night, Sunday, that's back when we used to have Sunday morning church, Sunday night church, Wednesday night church, a couple of revivals during the year, air night, 6 a.m. prayer. Y'all know about that 6 a.m. prayer. I don't even know if God was awake then, but we prayed. And one Sunday night after church, my dad said, hey, we're going to eat. We never went to eat after church because we didn't have any money. I was like, ah. Where are we going to eat? Taco Bell. Ah, nobody leaves Taco Bell hungry. You can have $2 in your pocket and get 10 tacos. Come on, somebody. So we, went to Taco, we went to Taco Bell, and, and we're in line, and we're behind these people. And uh, I noticed I'm a little kid. I was probably eight at that point. And, and these guys were in front of us, and they were, they were using real foul language and just talking real nasty. And here's my dad and my mom and me and my brother. And, and my dad, you know, I come from a cowboy family. So my dad, like, respect is a big deal. So he was, he was very kind. But he was like, hey, gentlemen, if you don't mind, I've got my wife and my kids here. Do you all mind just keeping it a little bit quieter so my boys don't hear that kind of talk? Not, not judging you guys. And they stepped up on my dad fast. There were four of them. And they were like, what are you going to do about it? And my dad's about five foot eight. He's all dynamite, but he's five foot eight. And he said, guys, I don't want any trouble. I'm just, I'm a pastor. I'm just, and it's like, well, well you're going to be in trouble. You're in trouble right now. You can't talk to us like that. And literally, before I even knew what happened, Pastor Mike, before, I, this, the, the biggest man I've ever seen in my life, like stepped past my dad, towering over these dudes. And he grabbed the guy in front by the, the front of his collar, and he said, let me tell you something. He said, I'm here to help him, and I'm going to be watching you. And if you mess with this man, you're going to answer to me. He said, I'm not here to eat. I'm not going to eat anything. I'm going to stand right over there up against that wall, and I'm going to watch you this entire time. And then he turned to my dad, and he said, hey, preacher, it's going to be all right. Don't you worry about it. My dad never told him he was a preacher. I don't know where the dude came from. All I know is heaven sent a thug angel to come up in there and deal with some stuff. Because when you cry crazy prayers, God will show up. I can't doubt him because I know too much about him. All I have is all I need. Crazy prayers. Sometimes you got to learn how to be oblivious to the obvious. Obviously, we can't get in here. Obviously, the building hasn't been remodeled yet. Obviously, it needs some work. Obviously, it's going to take a lot. But we're oblivious to the obvious because God spoke it. Paul was good at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, he said this. Now, you got to listen. Paul was gospel. I believe that when Paul got converted, he was converted into a gospel church with a 150-voice choir that swayed because he's weird. His responses are weird. Listen, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, for our light affliction, that's torture. That's what's happening. Prison, torture, people dying. Our light affliction is but for a moment. Is working for us far more exceeding an eternal weight of glory. Now watch what he says. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are hazy. The things we fully don't understand, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Whenever you learn how to not keep your eyes on your affliction, your affliction works for you. When you learn how to not keep your eyes on your adversity, your adversity actually advances you, and God can use your pain to produce your promise if you won't stare at it and complain about it and talk about how it ain't going to work. Oh, I'm preaching up in here on a Sunday. 
Prayer works. There's no new secrets. Prayer works. Prayer changes things. Paul and Silas get thrown in prison for preaching Jesus. You ever got in trouble for doing the right thing? You, you, how many of y'all have a crazy brother, a crazy sibling, always got in trouble? And you got in trouble just because you were standing next to him. I was like, you get over here too. Like, Mama, I didn't even do anything, but you're both in trouble. And you're like, why? I didn't do anything. You got to know that's how they walk in feeling. I didn't do anything. We're just preaching in Jesus' name. But that's not how Paul responds. They go into prison and Paul is gospel. Remember? Paul looks at Silas and goes, I've got an idea. Let's sing. That's, that's what church mothers say. You know what I mean? God is good all the time. And all the time, God is, God is good. He doesn't answer email. He answers an email. Come on, somebody. Those kind of people drive me crazy, and I love them because they get in prison, and they don't complain about it, and they don't whine about it, and they don't wonder what God's going to do. They started singing a song, and I don't know what they started singing, but I kind of believe they started singing something like, can't nobody do me like Jesus. White people, can't nobody do me like the Lord. I said, can't nobody do me like Jesus. Why? And all of a sudden, the ground that they were standing on began to shake, and the walls of that prison began to crumble, and every door came open because there's power when we pray. Can I tell you this? Crazy prayer doesn't just work for you. It works for the people around you. Some of you have been whining about why you're in the prison of where you are. Why am I in this misunderstanding? Why am I in this situation? Why am I in this relationship that doesn't seem to be going anywhere? Why haven't I got the raise? Why haven't I got the promotion? Sometimes God allows you to go in prison, not just to put you in prison, but so that your praise can bust somebody else out. So we got to stop being selfish with our prayers and start saying, God, it's not about us. It's not even just about Tulsa. It's about the United States of America. It's about the world. When you have crazy prayers, you'll have crazy purpose. That's what hazy faith will give you, crazy purpose. You were born an original. Don't die a copy. Understand your identity. God created you on purpose for a purpose, but so many of us don't really know who we are. So we don't actually walk in the authority that we have. A few years ago, I was traveling somewhere, and I, I was going through uh, the TSA line. God bless TSA. I was going through the TSA line. I knew I was going to be a little bit late. I was like, all right, God, I need you to help me, Jesus. I'm standing there in the line by myself. I'm just, you know, I'm just standing there just looking around. And one of the TSA agents in the, the black pants and the blue shirt, I, I hear her get very authoritative. She says, hey, sir. I was like, oh, somebody in trouble. <laughs> I look around I'm like, man, she's mad. And she's looking kind of over towards me. And she's like, you, sir, in the black shirt. And I was like. Yes. She was like, come here now. I was like, ah, why? Can't I just stay here? <laughs> I ain't got nothing. I ain't got no bombs. Except these Holy Ghost bombs I'm going to drop at this conference later, but I ain't got nothing. <laughs> so I'm walking over them scared to death. Everybody's looking. Literally, I can hear people going, ooh. Like I'm in elementary school. Like, oh, he's in trouble. She's like, right here, right here, come here, right here. When I got about two feet from her, she went, Pastor, I'm so glad to see you. I said, ah, daughter of the Lord, blessed of the most high. She said, come on through. I got to get you through. You're my pastor. I was like, oh, you are blessed and highly favored. What can I pray for you for? Don't keep it long. Boy, got a plane to catch. Let's go. Sometimes you have authority that you don't even know about because you don't know who you are and somebody else knows who you are and God puts you in positions to walk into authority and you've got to accept it and receive it. Please, I'm begging you, stop asking to stay in line when God calls you out. You've got to know who you are and whose you are. If you don't know who you are and whose you are, <laughs> you'll copy somebody else. Can I just talk to the saints for a minute? 
I am so tired of copycat callings. Just because my gift looks like your gift doesn't mean we have to do the same thing. And if I'm not careful, I'll allow my gift to dictate my calling. And I won't allow prayer to help me find my purpose. I'll look at the person that looks the closest to me and I'll say, well, maybe I'm supposed to do that. Because we don't understand the difference between gifting and calling. And some of you are chasing something that God never called you to do. Instagram called you to it, but God didn't call you to it. Let me tell you the difference between giftings and callings. Giftings are cultivated through practice. Callings are cultivated through prayer. We don't need more practice. We need more prayer. Because if you're not careful and you don't understand the difference between your gifting and your calling... You will prostitute your calling to the person who honors your gift. And then you're out of the will of God. Some of you are here. Uh, some of you are here because you, you want to be up here. And you need to be out there. Thank God for the, the team of volunteers here who selflessly serve and say, I'm ready. Let's go. You need to go through the membership class. You need to get involved. You need to serve wherever. And if God brings you up, let God bring you up. Just serve. But some of us don't even know that our gift is a gift. We're wishing we had something else. We're wishing we had somebody else's gift. How many guys like Apple products? Apple products, anybody? Where are the iPhone users at? Anybody got an iPhone? iPhone user? Like Apple, yeah, like Apple products. All right, I need, I need two people. Okay. You and you, right there in the shirt. All right, come right here. Okay. All right, just stay right there. All right. You like Apple products? What's your name, man? Jalil. What? Jalil. All right, there you go, Jalil. All right. Open it up. Open it up. Open it up. Move the paper. Just, you can, you can do it like Christmas, bro. You ain't got to be nice. Like Christmas. There's your iPad, bro. There you go. God bless you. It's for you, Jalil. It's for you. Hi, man. Hey, Jalil. That's your gift. All right, you can sit down. You say thank you. Oh, never mind. All right. What's your name? Abby. Here you go, Abby. Open. Open. Okay, just hang on just a second. Go ahead and open your gift. Go ahead and open your gift. All right. Apple, Apple products. Apple, all right, hold it up. Now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. I said Apple products. Now, now listen. If I'm, if I'm Abby, I'm, I'm a little upset. I'm like, hey, 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 bruh. You said Apple products. And here's the problem, though. You can see it in this situation. But in your situation, she's mad at him. Because somehow he was on the right side and got the gift that she wanted. But really, she doesn't need to be mad at him. She needs to be mad at me. When you're jealous of someone else's gift, you're not mad at them. You're mad at God. And you need to at some point just give that to God. Don't you think that his shoulders are big enough to handle your anger and your frustration and your pain about all the stuff that you've gone through? And don't you think that he can make a way where there is no way? Because once you begin to bring it to God and he begins to give you purpose, he can help you understand the gift. The iPad is awesome, but the apple has sustenance. And if you understand the power of seed, eat the apple, don't eat the seed. Plant the seed, and the apple will feed you for years to come. It's not about the gift. It's about your calling. Will, come here. Thanks. There you go, Abby. I didn't want to mess with you. Give Abby a great big hand. Hey, Abby, I already know. She sent a message to Pastor Mike this morning and said, I feel like God's going to give me an iPad so that I can do what he's called me to do in college. I already know. I already know. I prayed about it this morning. 
I've never given an iPad out, and I had an idea today to give an iPad, and then somebody came to me. It was like, hey, there's a girl here praying. I was like, well, let's be the answer to the prayer that she's been praying because God has already dropped the answer on your timeline. You just got to learn how to keep walking until you get to what God has got for you. You know who you are. You'll fight fear with faith. Can I tell you all a story? I wasn't going to tell it, but I want to tell it. He said, tell it. Okay. It's my favorite story. So my dad started this church whenever I was a kid. And when I was about 15, we had this small church youth group, about 40 young people. And we had this night where we all hung out. It was like, you know, just all a youth party. And after the, <laughs> after the youth party, like the girls... We're going to have a slumber party. And the guys, we're going to have a hangout. Because we don't have a slumber party. You know what I mean? Like, hey, man, you want to come to my slumber party? No. <laughs> so the goal of the girls' slumber party was, oh, let's do each other's hair and makeup. Let's have a good time. It's going to be amazing. We'll talk about boys. And the goal of the guys' hangout was let's get to the girls' slumber party. And as the, as the son of the pastor, as, as a young man of God, I felt like it was my responsibility to lead that effort to get us from, from where we were to where God had called us to go. So I went and I talked to, I went and I talked to the lady that was in charge of it. And I said, hey, how cool would it be if tonight, like you know, around midnight, we just rolled up and we scared the girls. Like, ah. They never forget that moment. And I thought she was going to be like, little boy, get out of here. She was like, oh, my God, that's such a great idea. You guys should definitely do it. I was like, oh, my God, we let you watch children. This is crazy. She said, come over at midnight. I'll leave the garage door open and the garage door unlocked. And you'll come in and just scare them. I'll have them ready. They'll be in the living room. I was like, you're crazy. And so we went to Walmart and we got pantyhose, not to put on, but to put over our heads. And we put the pantyhose over our head because it makes you look crazy. And we snuck in and we walked. I couldn't believe it. And she had all the girls in our youth group sitting around, sitting around this little living room fire. She had a flashlight under her chin. And she was telling ghost stories. Like the man was walking down the railroad tracks looking for his head. Ooh, isn't that scary, girls? And there was like 15 of us in the house, and they didn't even know it. And we jumped out around the corner on the count of three. We are like, ah, and the girls like, ah, ah, freaked out. I left out one detail. The church that my father pastored was a very diverse church. When white girls are scared, they're like, oh, my God, Becky. Oh, God. Oh, oh, Sabrina. Oh, Nancy. Oh, my God. Call your dad. Oh, my God. What are we going to do? African-American girls are different. There was this girl named Kiki. And she didn't love me. She was sitting right here to the left. Kiki screamed, and then she grabbed a ficus tree. You know one of them little decorative trees? They should have a warning label. She picked it up. She started swinging it at me. I couldn't get the panty out of my head. We were running. She picked up the phone. She was like, Piggy, call Pookie and them. Y'all get over here. These fools are acting crazy. The Spanish girls were cussing us in Spanish. The white girls are like, you guys better go. Oh, my God, they're really mad. It didn't go the way I planned. The next time the enemy comes in on you, you ought to get a spirit of kiki and pick up the word and say, God is greater in me than he that is in the world. I got purpose. Sit down. When you know who you are, when you know who you are, Pastor Mike, Natalie, you know who you are. You have such an incredible gift. You could use it in the world to make movies. You could make music. You could be one of the greatest producers of our time. And you might still be. I don't know about that yet. But you chose at some point. 
you wrestled with it for a long time. You said, God, why am I here doing this when I know my gifting is great? You knew the gift he gave you. You knew it. The calling shifted everything, though. And the calling put you on your knees. And you said, all right, I yield the gift. I surrender the gift. And now look at what God's doing with the gift because the calling, it, co it comes first. When you know who you are, not even the rewards of the world will deter who you are and what you are called to do. Listen, in, in, the book, in the book of Matthew, there's a woman, the Syrophoenician woman. She comes to Jesus. She's a Gentile. She's not even supposed to approach him, much less touch him, not even be close to him. She comes to Jesus because of racial division and cultural divides. She comes to Jesus, and here's why. She's got a need. She's got crazy faith. Hazy faith. I don't know how it's going to happen. She's been praying crazy prayers, and she's got crazy purpose. She knows what her identity is. So she comes to Jesus, and she says, my daughter is sick and desperate. I'm desperate. I need you, Jesus. And he doesn't even, he ignores her. Has God ever been silent? And then the people that are around Jesus start saying, hey, 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 get out of here. You shouldn't be here. You ever felt rejected by the church? You ever been hurt by the people that are close to Jesus and actually supposed to represent him, but they don't? They represent their own needs and their own wants and their own desires. Please, please forgive them. Please don't judge the heart of Jesus based on some people who are supposed to represent him. He loves you deeply. He loves you dearly. Here's what happens. Oh, hang on. I gotta take a drink. Oh. As for Biggie and Pac. <laughs> White people are like, uh, Biggie and who? And she comes to Jesus. Here's what the Bible says. Real preacher will be back next week, guys. Just, let's just get through this. Matthew chapter 15, verse 25. But she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, one of the most shocking statements in Scripture, and I've struggled with it for years. She said, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Turn to your neighbor and say, he called her a dog. But she said, yes, Lord. <laughs> she doesn't even argue. She doesn't even say, I'm not a dog. Don't you call me a dog. Nobody calls me a dog. And walks right out of her miracle. She says, yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, oh, woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed. This is strange because Jesus feels one way and then it changes. Now what we know on the other side of it is he was testing her faith. Can Jesus deter you from your identity, from your purpose? Because your faith will be tested. That's what brings perseverance. That's what works out your destiny. She never even argues that she's a dog. She says one word, Pastor Mike. Ah, uh -huh. ah, that changed it. When I saw this, I freaked out. I had a praise break right in my hotel room. She said, yeah, but even the children eat the crumbs that fall from there. Everybody say there. That means ownership, their master's table. She said, I might be a dog, but I'm your dog. And I know if I'm under your authority, no matter what I'm going through, you're going to take care of me. No matter what I'm dealing with, I got crazy purpose. I know who I am, and I know whose I am, and I'm going to trust you. Somebody shout trust him. And that will lead to the final thing. Musicians, you guys can come and play a little churchy music. Crazy prayers lead to crazy purpose, lead to crazy perseverance. And you're sitting in crazy perseverance. First few months as pastor, I saw it today. He wrote a document with your janky pages skills. You put the logo of Transformation Church on the front of this building years ago. He didn't tell you about it because you weren't ready for it. And this place definitely wasn't ready for it. But it's perseverance that will walk you into your promise. At some point, you've got you've to learn, i got to just trust in the middle of pain. This is a word for somebody. 
A few years ago, I was flying somewhere. I don't even remember where I was flying somewhere. And the pilot came on. He was like, ah, ladies and gentlemen, ah. I don't know why y'all talk like that, but ah. We're, we're about to, ah. We're about 20 minutes. Flight attendants, please prepare the cabin for landing. So I was like, all right, 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes. I'll be able to make my connection. We're good. After 20 minutes, nothing. After 30 minutes, nothing. After 50 minutes, nothing. I'm getting mad. And the pilot comes on. He's like, I'm so sorry. Before we were about to land, a, fl a storm blew over the runway. And, and it was not safe for us to land. We're just in a holding pattern right now. See, I, I was ready. But where I was going... And you know what I said? I said, I, I, I'm okay with that, bro. I'd rather be Jeremy Foster late than the late Jeremy Foster. Come on. <laughs> Some of you are trying to push your way into somewhere that's not ready for you yet. If you'll just wait on God and let him walk you in and let him bleed you in. That's why we're sitting here right now. I'm going to close with this. This is the word I got sitting right over there. When I, when I got here in my hotel room Wednesday night, Late Wednesday night, I walked in. My wife was like, babe, they got you a gift. I was like, oh, they got me a gift. I got this gift. I was like, oh, I got a gift. Look at that. And I opened it up. And I was like, oh, oh. look at this. I was like, that thing my wife been saying, I got him. And I got to tell you, though, that ain't my style. So I, I looked at the gift, and I was like, oh, love the gift. Going to be grateful for the gift. Going to say thank you for the gift. I'm not ready to wear the gift yet at some point when the time is right. Here's the word that I got whenever I was sitting right over there because I looked down at my feet, and I had on my Nikes. And the Lord said to me, tell transformation. It's not going to be comfortable. There were some amazing things that happened at 1519 that prepared us to walk into what we are in right now. But at some point, you're going to have to take off what you're comfortable with and, and get it off of your feet and say, we can't go back. Now, here's what I want you to know. There's a moment in the middle that's uncomfortable when we don't have everything figured out. When people will look at you and say, you're not really prepared. It doesn't look like you're really ready. But there's going to be a moment when God reveals to you that it's time. You're going to have to stomp a little bit. You, you might even, you might even lose your balance a little bit. You have to turn your little, your little hop into a dance at some point when you lose your balance you got to learn how to dance through it you got to learn how to praise through it you got to learn how to say hey i know people may not understand it but i'm walking in new shoes and i'm going to do what god has called me to do let's go pastor mike i got boot cut jeans on and nike shoes with a tag that I don't understand the tag. I told my wife, I was like, let me cut the tag off. She's like, don't cut the tag off. You may not be comfortable, but it ain't about your comfort. It's about your calling. And my faith might be hazy, but God's got a plan. And God's got a strategy. And he wants to do something. And he can do exceeding abundantly. Above all I can ask or think according to the power that's at work in me. Somebody shout, it's in me. Somebody shout, all I have is all I need. God, I thank you for each and every person under the sound of my voice. I pray that you would propel this church forward into an uncomfortable place because that's where you've called us. Strengthen marriages, strengthen visions, strengthen dreams, strengthen hearts, change lives. And more than anything, 
save souls with nobody looking around and nobody moving around in any of our environments right now. Just stay where you are if you don't mind. This is the most important moment. If you know you're not where you need to be with Jesus, somehow you haven't just yielded your life. The Bible says this, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. But you have got to declare that Jesus is Lord. You've got to realize, I, I need you, Jesus, and I repent. I trust you. Change me from the inside out. The Bible says when you acknowledge him, he will acknowledge you. With nobody looking around, if you know, I need to acknowledge him right now. I need to make Jesus the center of my life. Would you boldly put your hand in the air and acknowledge him right now and say, that's me, hands all over the room. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, let's give them a great big hand. I love that. Now I want everybody in the room, those of you watching online around the world, I want you to pray this prayer declaratively and with power. Say, Jesus, you're the only one who can save me. So I trust you with my life. I repent of my sins. I believe you're the son of God and you died on a cross and you rose again so that I could have life. Change me from the inside out. I'm asking you, Jesus, to be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's give him an ovation of worship that only a king is worthy of.